Good morning, everybody. My name is George Condus, and it's a great honor to be uh, invited to speak today at the World Congress on Endometriosis. I'm going to be focusing my talk today on uh, imaging in endometriosis, and in particular, looking at ultrasound. There's been a revolution when it comes to imaging and endometriosis over the last 20 years. And um, what are some of the things that have contributed to this? I think the evolution of uh, luminary units around the world has uh, been an important aspect in the, in the development of ultrasound technology. I think new ultrasound techniques and innovations have also been part of this revolution. There's been a greater understanding of the anatomical locations uh, for deep endometriosis, and this makes it uh, front and center, particularly when we're trying to ascertain the, uh, the, the, the location and extent of disease. There's been greater collaboration between luminary ultrasound and luminary laparoscopic units. And we see this in South America, in Italy, in the United Kingdom, in Europe, and also in Australasia. Uh, there's been an interdisciplinary approach, which has been strongly advocated by the uh, NICE guidelines in the UK and also the World Endometriosis Society. Um, and I think one of the most important things that's happened in the last 10 years has been bringing the luminaries and experts uh, from all around the world together um, when they were commissioned to develop international deep endometriosis analysis uh, consensus statement. And this was published in 2016 in the White Journal and to date has had 333 citations. Um, I think there, without a doubt, is a greater synergy now between a high resolution transvaginal imaging specialties and specialists and those that use either robotic or laparoscopic surgeries or technologies for interventions. Uh, and I think there's also this is a result of the emergence of the surgeon sonologist where uh, individuals such as myself have undergone both a uh, gynae ultrasound fellowship and also an advanced laparoscopic uh, fellowship such that you've got uh, an all encompassing service that uh, where the person who performs the ultrasound scan is also the person that plans the management is also the person that does the uh, high level uh, surgical procedures. I think there's still a great variation in relation to the type of scan that a woman is, uh, has access to when it comes to assessing someone with symptoms suggestive of endometriosis. And so the basic transvaginal ultrasound scan is recommended by the American Institute of Ultrasound Medicine, um, indeed looks only at the uterus and ovaries. Uh, and when it comes to assessing for um, endometriosis, we only will look for the presence of absence of hard markers such as an endometrioma or hydrosalpinx. And the problem with this conventional assessment is that it um, uh, often results in women with a normal ultrasound scan being taken to theater and subsequently having significant endometriosis. Um, the downside to this um, basic pelvic ultrasound evaluation only is that there's no detailed surgical planning. And so you tend to have a disciplinary approach by the gynecological team. Um, in those women, and it can be up to 20% of those that present with chronic pelvic pain, dyskesia, uh, will have bowel endometriosis with or without pouch of bugs obliteration. This results in unplanned intraoperative colorectal consultation. And under those circumstances, the patient's not bowel prepped, the patient is not specifically consented in relation to potential bowel procedures. And so consequently, there is either a peak and shriek, in which case the woman needs to have a second laparoscopic procedure, um, or there's suboptimal site of reduction um, of the endometriotic disease at the first surgery. And when uh, potentially women have complex disease, there's going to be high rates of complications. Um, and as stated previously, there is that potential for people then to close that case and then refer someone on to an advanced endoscopic surgical unit for the, the high stage disease. With the introduction of the IDEA consensus uh, opinion in 2016, um, I think that, that this plus the aforementioned contributing factors in relation to this revolution in ultrasound imaging for endometriosis, this has resulted, I think, in now us able to being able to map in detail the extent of uh, endometriotic disease from a location uh, and, and potential depth perspective. Uh, this invokes a multidisciplinary team, uh, enables us to prospectively arrange uh, preoperative colorectal consultation such that when we then uh, proceed to surgery, particularly in those women with, with um, high stage uh, disease, these women have bowel prep, they're consented specifically for their bowel procedure, which could be a shaving, a disectomy or a segmental resection. And because at 
time of surgery we've got the right surgeons the right multidisciplinary team at the surgical table then we're going to optimally cite or reduce that in the, the volume of endometriotic disease at that first surgery and because the surgery is planned because the patient knows what's going on we do these cases uh, in, com in a combined way on a joint list where there's no rush we have lower complication rates and in doing so those particularly with high stage disease we can perform these cases as a one-step laparoscopy uh, with both gynecological colorectal and neurological inputs so i think ultrasound really is the cornerstone to being able to avoid that uh, that diagnostic laparoscopy and use the ultrasound to plan the appropriate surgical intervention the um, approach by the idea group was divided into four steps so the first step which is obviously the basic pelvic ultrasound scan i won't go into where we look at the uterus and ovaries uh, but then beyond that we wanted to be very clear about additional uh, ultrasound assessments that should be done during an evaluation of someone that presents with potential underlying endometriosis the second step is looking at the evaluation of soft markers and in particular looking at ovarian mobility and we can see it here in this um, in this video that we've got a very mobile ovary that's mobile up against the pelvic sidewall and also mobile up against the uterus itself. So having ovarian mobility is a very important aspect to predict uh, normal pathology, particularly in relation to the pelvic sidewall. It's also important to evaluate the ovary um, both uh, laterally against the pelvic sidewall and also intramedially against the uterosacral ligament. And we know that in work that's come out of Shannon Reed's group in, in Sydney, that in those women that have a negative ovarian sliding sign, that they're more likely to potentially need to have ureterolysis. And so knowing ahead of time that there's potential for pelvic sidewall disease, which can be predicted by the absence of the sliding sign, particularly up against the uterosacral ligament and the pelvic sidewall, can be a predictor of the need to form a ureterolysis, which should invoke the a referral to a, a, a minimally invasive surgical group. Step three of the idea consensus statements is to evaluate the pouch of Douglas in real time to get an understanding of whether we think the sliding sign is positive or whether the sliding sign is negative. And so here we have a matching video in someone who's got a very mobile rectum up against the rectal cervix. And in the matching video to the right of screen, we can see quite clearly that this laparoscopic view shows a non obliterated pouch of Douglas. So based on the ultrasound evaluation with a positive sliding sign, we would predict that this patient has indeed a non obliterated pouch of Douglas. Conversely, in the situation where um, upon placing pressure against the lower uterus and cervix, we can see that the actual bowel itself is fixed to the lower uterine segment, it's fixed to the torus uterinus, and there's a deep endometriotic nodule here in the torus uterinus. There's a pleomorphic reaction here where the rectum is fixed to the rectal cervix. And in this situation with matching video, we can see that indeed, we've got significant rectal uterine adhesions and what's driving that is underlying uh, rectal deep endometriosis with torus uterinus deep endometriosis. And so when scanning this patient, we would predict this woman to have a negative sliding sign, which in turn um, would predict the presence of a obliterated pouch of Douglas. Here's another video here again, where the rectum is stuck up against the left um, uterosacral ligament. We can see the presence of uterosacral ligament and neutrotic nodule. And we can see there's partial obliteration of the pouch of Douglas with the rectosigmoid adherent to the back of the cervix on the left side and also the uterosacral ligament. And so the final aspect when it comes to utilizing ultrasound to particularly plan what we may want to do with patients, and that could include both medical or surgical intervention, we compartmentalize the pelvis into anterior and posterior compartments, noting that in those women that have bladder lesions, the most common site for a bladder lesion, bladder lesion will be at the vesicle base. And this is a very nice uh, 3D rendered representation on the left of the screen where we can see a bladder base endometriotic lesion, which is being cut, cold cut, removed uh, in a, a partial cystectomy at the time of laparoscopy. So we get very high resolution um, images on transvaginal ultrasound, which helps us to plan the type of potential bladder procedure. We know that the ureters themselves should also be evaluated in this patient that I've just mentioned. The ureters indeed were not um, uh, were not distally obstructed and so both ureters demonstrated normal vermiculation, a normal AP diameter, and there was no distal obstruction in relation to the ureteric jets. 
having looked at the anterior compartment, it's really important in the presence of a uterosacral ligament nodule, which we can see here, uh, this sometimes can be associated with hydroureter. And so when we have a uterosacral ligament nodule that is infiltrating laterally into the parametrial tissue, it's critical to evaluate the caliber of the ureter to determine whether indeed there may be a hydroureter and indeed on the right-hand side, we can see matching images in this case where this deep endometrial nodule resulted in a hydroureter. So this patient was scheduled for um, an interval um, ureteric reimplantation on the left side. So we've looked at the anterior compartment and now we look compartmentally to the posterior compartment of the bowel, uterosacral ligaments, the torus uterinus, posterior vaginal fornix and rectal vaginal septum. And we know that there is a high correlation uh, between predicting rectal endometriosis on ultrasound, as we can see here depicted here by a hypoechoic lesion in the upper rectum at the level of the posterior vaginal fornix, where we can see there's a, a minimal degree of sliding presence. And when we correlate that with the laparoscopic images, we can see quite clearly that this woman does have partial obliteration. It's probably di difficult to, to, uh, to know what's driving that, but based on the ultrasound to the left of the screen, we can see that that's driven by an underlying deep endometriotic nodule of the rectum itself. So this woman underwent a joint case, a planned case, where we knew ahead of time what was happening uh, based on the ultrasound imaging. Here's another example here of a woman who's got a deep endometriotic nodule within the uh, rectum, but gliding freely against the posterior vaginal fornix and also the retrocervix. So we've got a rectal nodule with a positive sliding sign, and we can see here in the matching laparoscopic picture at the top, and then when that lesion is removed with a disectomy under cold cutting, that correlated with the presence of a rectal lesion with a normal pouch of Douglas. <clears throat> and finally, another example here on the left of screen where we've got a patient with a very large uh, rectal lesion that's fixed to the coming into play here on the left hand screen here that's fixed to the vagina there's also a vaginal nodule here this is the rectal nodule out of Douglas is obliterated in matching laparoscopic videos where again we can see that the uterus is antiverted retroflexed bowel is stuck to the uterus with the presence of rectal you find a we know based on that preoperative imaging that this patient's got a large rectal lesion and the surgery having been completed where she's had a full uh, anatomical, um, uh, her anatomy is being restored to normal. The segmental reception is being performed. We can see now that the uterus is very mobile. The pouch of Douglas now is indeed not obliterated at the end of the surgery. So the ultrasound again in this situation has been absolutely critical to the planning of management. When we move laterally in the posterior compartment to the uterosacral ligaments, <laughs> Um, probably the best time to scan these patients is during the second half of the cycle because we know that there can be some fluid present during the luteal phase, which makes it easier to visualize the uterosacral ligament coming into view just here. And again, again, looking here quite clearly at the uterosacral ligament here in this, this rounded hypoechoic lesion just here, denoted with the yellow arrow, represents a uterosacral ligament nodule, but with the bowel being mobile against this uterosacral ligament nodule. And finally, when it comes to evaluating the pelvis in the posterior compartment, it's important to assess the rectovaginal septum, which we can see on the left-hand side in a mid sagittal view, posterior vaginal fornix. The white line here represents the rectovaginal septum, which is commencing or it originates from the recto uteri pouch. And the rectovaginal septum divides the posterior vaginal fornix with the muscularis um, of the rectum itself. Almost always on ultrasound and at laparoscopy, the rectovaginal septum and the rectovaginal space are clear of disease. On the right-hand side, we can see that there's a gel sonovaginography. We've got a um, fairly well demarcated vaginal nodule present as well. And in this situation here, where we can see that there's a vaginal nodule protruding through the posterior vaginal fornix and we can see on the right there in the vaginoscopy, the presence of uh, posterior vaginal fornix endometriosis on the video. And that is contiguous posteriorly, because we know on scan, the presence of a deep endometriotic nodule of the bowel with also obliteration of the pouch of Douglas. So ultrasound is absolutely an, an essential tool in planning these difficult cases. There's been new techniques over the course of the last 10 to 15 years. Um, 2003, the introduction of saline infusion sonovaginography to improve the detection of uh, posterior compartment endometriosis. We modified this in 2014 with our technique of gel infusion sonovaginography, which was further 
uh, validated by Leon's group in South America. Uh, COSI's groups also used uh, 3D renders in mid sagittal planes and also coronal views to give very clear pictures of posterior vaginal fornix endometriosis, which I think is very illustrative. Uh, rectal water contrast transvaginal ultrasound is, is excellent um, at delineating the nodule and also giving an idea of the depth of penetration. Although when compared to transvaginal ultrasound, there doesn't seem to be a significant difference between the two modalities. Um, and in a recent meta-analysis that we published in the White Journal, um, rectal endoscopic sonography was the um, best performer performance from the point of view of sensitivity and specificity for predicting uh, endometriosis in the posterior compartment. A new, tech, a new technique that we've published on uh, last in 2019 and 2020, where we've instilled uh, saline into the pouch of Douglas via a saline infusion uh, intrauterine balloon catheter, enables us to uh, get a standoff technique where the fluid descends the pouch of Douglas from the mid-sagittal view, and then here in the transverse view, and the uh, transvaginal probe is sitting here, and then the sonolucent area represents the vagina, the white line in that mid transverse is the peritoneum of the pouch of Douglas. We can see a transverse section through the rectum itself. And we can see beautifully as that uh, fluid fans out laterally, we can see the pelvic, pelvic sidewalls on the left and right sides. So it's enabled us in our first validation study on just over 40 cases where we perform sonopedography intraoperatively and blinded the surgeon, uh, sorry, the, 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 the sonologist to the outcomes of the laparoscopy, we can see quite clearly here that these are depictions of superficial endometriosis, which we demonstrated uh, laparoscopically and histologically. So our pickup rate of pouch of Douglas and posterior compartment superficial disease is 80%. So moving forward, I think it's really important that we should spread the word in relation to endometriosis imaging beyond sonologists and sonographers. Um, I think we need to um, challenge the way that we educate advocacy groups, advocacy groups, patients, family physicians, general gynecologists, facility, fertility specialists, and minimally invasive, minimally invasive endoscopic surgeons. And so I think by disseminating information about the power of ultrasound and the positive predictive value of high, res high resolution imaging in experienced hands, we have the ability to change, I think, the course of management and potentially improve the outcomes for such patients. I think we need to think about increasing our accessibility to training opportunities educationally in both gynae ultrasound and also advanced endoscopic surgery through forums such as this particular meeting, also through um, other societies, the ISGE, the ESGE, Ages in Australia, as well as the larger colleges, so the RCOG, RANSCOG, Ages, etc. Um, and I think in the end, we should aim for all women who are potentially scheduled for endometriosis surgery to not only have access to, but actually undergoing a detailed deep endometriosis ultrasound by an expert, which will enable then the clinical team, the surgical team planning the surgery to know exactly the extent and location of disease, and more importantly, which aspects are, are involved anteriorly and posteriorly, which would in turn would result in the need to include uh, urology and or colorectal surgery. So thank you so much for your